Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have a very special guest, Amanda Ashley. Amanda is an advanced lightning process practitioner based in Portland, Oregon, where she teaches people the tools to change how their mind and body interact so they can recover from a full range of chronic conditions. So in my adventures of creating Positively COVID, I was learning about so many recovery stories. And I kept coming across people that had recovered by using the lightning process. And they were having these amazing results. And even though I had recovered at this stage, I thought, I need to try this. I need to do this course so I can understand the language and know this process in order to further my knowledge and support those that are continuing to down this path of recovery. So I reached out to Amanda and I signed up for the course. And I knew that there would be benefits from the lightning process and I understood the premise. But what I didn't know was that it was going to change my life. It almost just chokes me up because Amanda taught me how much influence I had on my life and how I could harness and step into these states of mind and emotions and the physical body that I wanted. It has been just one of the most amazing and transformative times in my life. And I am so grateful. And so first of all, Amanda, thank you so much. And thank you for being here today. And I'm excited to have you share with everybody what pot, what lightning process is and some of the tools such as language and how that affects our health. And so again, welcome and thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And of course, um, thank you for being such a wonderful client. Um, it was such a pleasure to, to work with you and to watch you flourish and blossom. And um, you know, that's the joy for me to see people re reclaim not only their health, but but also their life. And, and it is just a joy to watch that. So thank you, Amy, very, very much. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> So if you could begin by just telling us, what is the lightning process? So I joke with people that that's actually one of the hardest questions for us to answer, um, because in many ways it, it is so very many things. And you you think I think you did a great job of explaining um, that, that it helps people harness the mind body connection that is so very powerful. Um, to change, you know, not not only what their mind is doing, but therefore their their physiology, what their body's doing, because the two are so completely connected. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's a three day training that actually begins when people start to think about it, mm -hmm. and we invite people to engage in quite a thorough um, process, as you well know, before even doing the training itself, mm -hmm. the three day seminar because we want people to learn about the mind body connection to really think about you know where they are in their own life are they ready to take on something like this are they ready to make the changes that are, are required to change how the mind and the body are interacting to become much more influential in their lives so we put people through quite a few steps all of which are designed to help people begin to understand that they do have that influence and already start to see change, which is very exciting. So that by the time they come to the three-day training, um, they're, they're already feeling more empowered, more ready, more confident. And, um, and then the three-day training is um, a very experiential kind of um, experience <laughs> um, in that we have several people um, up, up to five in, in, a, um, in, in each group. Um, it's online now, which it did not used to be, which makes it so much more accessible for people from around this this vast country of ours. Um, 
And it's it's an opportunity to understand more about how the mind and body work, of course, um, but also to start to become more aware of our own patterns that are, are contributing to this, this stuckness that we're experiencing about in, in not recovering from something. And in this case, it's it's COVID. You know, why why is it that some people are recovering and, and most people are recovering and some people get stuck in that recovery process? What's not aligning? Um, what's not allowing the body's natural healing system to work? So we want to uncover how people unconsciously are playing a role in that without meaning to, of course. Um, and so once they have that awareness, then they use the, um, they learn the tools that they can use to change those patterns and um, switch on the, the healing and flourishing pathways that have been um, overwhelmed by, by other pathways. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, it does. It makes, it makes great sense. So I know that this, and I, having experienced this three-day training there's so much that you taught us mm. um but one of the key ingredients was language and yeah. can you talk a little bit about how language and the language that we use influences our health yeah language is hugely influential when you think about you know it's how we converse with other people how we communicate with other people but it's also how we communicate with ourselves Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we think in language In we also think in images and so on, but language is very, very influential. And so when we're using language that is describing what we don't want, mm -hmm. even if we mean it um, in a positive way, our intention is that we're saying something positive, such as, well, let's take one of the, the key symptoms of, of um, COVID, long COVID fatigue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if somebody says, I don't want to be tired, that suggests they actually would want to be something else. But because the word tired has become so wired, mm. so associated with that state of being tired, those pathways are very, very strong. So every time we use that language, we are strengthening those pathways. And so think about the difference between saying, I don't want to be tired. Um, and I want to feel full of energy. Mm -hmm. Completely different, isn't it? Completely. Or I don't want to feel anxious. I want to feel calm and relaxed. Mm -hmm. Even the voice changes because we have certain intonation and in, that goes with each each of those words. So the, the those um, just those key um, the, the awarenesses of how we're using language can be really, really pivotal. And people, I think all of us have no idea how unconsciously we're, we're using the language of what we don't want. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I remember being one of the initial things that made a difference for me realizing, cause I had dealt with foot pain for years, long before I had been, you know, dealt with long COVID. And there was still some of that lingering when I did the training with you. And I remembered thinking, I want to be out of pain. Well, even saying the word pain, I've read that even on fMRIs show, well, then the pain signal lights up in the brain. And if you use these other words, you calm and quiet that part of the brain and those neural pathways and using other words that strengthen what you do want. Yes. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, and doing that over and over, seeing the change physiologically was, was miraculous. It was, it was yeah. really cool. Yeah. And, you know, you can see too, how it completely changes where we're putting our attention. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want pain well naturally you're going to well where is that pain or well, let me look for it let me oh yes let me focus on that mm -hmm. whereas if you're thinking about i want to feel completely comfortable then or just great <laughs> just want to feel great um suddenly your attention is available for, for much more um fun and interesting things right yeah and the brain doesn't hear the not so if i were to say to you please do not think about Elvis Presley juggling <laughs> 12 purple monkeys. <laughs> well, what are you thinking about? Think about Elvis juggling yep, and all those monkeys <laughs> flying about. Yeah, exactly. Um, so th this is just a very simple kind of habit 
of, of, of language and, and the way we're thinking that, that we can change easily and focus on throughout the day and, and will already make a change for people. Mm, wonderful. Oh, and yeah, you mentioned about where we put our focus. I know that the Mayo Clinic in their long COVID protocol amongst many things of mindfulness and relaxation is decrease focus on symptoms because they find that the people that focus so much on symptoms are paying that much more attention to it and keeping them alive. But that, you know, you get into and teach very specifics about how to not pay attention and to decrease that focus through editing and scanning were the were two of the tools that I remember loving so much. Can you share more about those? Yeah. So, you know, we do talk about body scanning because it's a very understandable pattern that people develop when they're feeling really stuck in their health. And if they weren't worried before, they're definitely becoming more worried now about how am I going to recover? What does this mean for my life? Oh, my gosh, I've got to recover. And you can feel how that sets off that stress response, Mm -hmm. which is actually what's hijacking our nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. Keeping it in that fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And so while it might be understandable, it's, it's the opposite of useful, because every time we're looking for something, it tends to be what we're going to find. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so once again, we're actually activating those pathways of those symptoms, strengthening those pathways. Mm-hmm. And we're also really distorting, actually, probably reality in that we're so focused on the things that aren't changing that we're not seeing a bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, and so we're likely to um, keep keep so much attention on the thing that's not right yet or the things that aren't right yet that we're not noticing any any gradual improvement in the bigger picture. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I remember early on when I was sick. Oh, I kept a list of my symptoms, you know, initially for my doctors say, oh, I'm dealing with this, this, this. And I would go over that list and go over it with them. And in hindsight, I I realized, you know, there were there was an importance at that stage, especially early on in COVID, because we we're cataloging all these crazy right. symptoms. Right. Right. But it was important to then emerge from that by stopping doing that because that was keeping me, keeping yes. me stuck and not um, focusing on what what I how I did want to feel. Yeah, exactly. And when you think about it. Um, with something like like long COVID, where there's been so much in the media, much of it not terribly helpful at all at all, um, it, it becomes an invitation to do that very thing. Oh, now I've got this symptom, and oh, you know, I'm even more stuck and than I than I was before. But if you think about other things that have happened to us in our in our time, all the colds, all the flus we've had, and we've recovered from them, all the times when we've cut our finger, and it's just magically healed. We haven't put our energy into studying that finger and that cut Mm -hmm. or thinking about every symptom to do with a cold. We might have complained a bit, (laughs) Um, but we've trusted that we were going to recover, that our body knew what to do. Mm -hmm. And some of what happens with something like long COVID is that we lose that sense of trust, that Mm -hmm. sense of hope. Mm -hmm. And so then we think, well, it's even more on us that we have to pay attention in order to give ourselves any chance of of recovery but that ends up being the opposite of useful because again it's firing up all the neurology of stuckness you know what's keeping us in this fight or flight response shutting down our healing system our parasympathetic nervous system is switched off Mm -hmm. um, in order to respond to this perceived emergency Mm -hmm. oh amazing yes it's uh one other thing that you had mentioned was that I I benefited from so much was when I learned how to use the language. We know, like you mentioned earlier, we 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 pick up on language everywhere, whether it's on social media or in the news, um, reading something, hearing other people's stories, but 
the language that we're using in our own heads and how we have that power to self-coach ourselves and 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 the way we talk to ourselves and how we can say specific things can you talk a little bit about that i mean the self-coaching thing for me was new to me i mean i had thought that i was a good self-coach until i really did it and yeah. and then it had a profound influence on me yes um this is probably the the part of the lightning process that i love the most because it really does help us um, gain new insight about the relationship we have with ourselves mm -hmm. and to recognize that perhaps we're not as kind to ourselves, not as supportive of ourselves, not as encouraging, um, as unconditionally accepting and compassionate as we might like to be um, in ways that we probably would find quite easy to be with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you think about stress, which in, in a sense is what the lightning process is teaching us to um, take on in a whole different way um, so that our body, our, our nervous system can get back into balance mm -hmm. and our brains and our, our bodies can communicate um, in a more appropriate and helpful way. Um, there's loads of stress out in the world. We, we don't need to go over that. We know that we're all bombarded, right? But what is, what's going on on the inside? Mm -hmm. How are we talking to ourselves? How are, what's the tone of the voice that's talking to ourselves mm -hmm. and once we start tuning into that and understanding that actually no not kind at all mm -hmm. quite judgmental very critical really mm -hmm. harsh mm -hmm. um no i'd never talk to anybody like this <laughs> you know phil parker who created the lightning process i will often say you know if i treated my friends the way i treat myself would i have any <laughs> well the answer for quite a number of us is is Probably not, right. you know. So once we start to get insight into what this these internal kind of conversations are about, which of course then lead us to look at what are the beliefs we're holding about ourselves? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of transformation is possible then when we learn how to become this much more empowering, much more this unconditionally loving and supportive coach? That all unto itself is quite transformational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it sure is. Now, when I know that when I was so sick and others out there are going through this, it is, it is hard to access those positive, calm, coaching voice when you feel so crabby. It, and it's 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 almost it's unfamiliar. It's it's just beyond your capacity. What are some steps that people just in that place before you know maybe they end up taking the lightning process or or other programs? What can they do today to take those small steps hmm. towards going from feeling completely crappy? Clearly, the the language they're using with themselves might be harsh or even if they are saying you can get better it's not congruent with the emotion which is you can get better or we believe you can get better what what are some things that they could do right now yeah great question i mean i think just off the top of my head few few thoughts what well, one would be um to take themselves back to another time in their life where you know the chips were down it, 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 they, they weren't sure how they were going to move on from whatever it was and somehow they did mm. somehow they found that within themselves to do whatever it was they needed to do mm -hmm. which might in turn help them remember even though this moment feels so difficult mm -hmm. it's temporary yeah yeah this isn't going to last forever yeah and this is something that that um you can you can find a way through and even if your your internal coach, your own internal coach is is just not available in that moment, as you say, to authentically give you that that kind of encouragement that you need, that belief you need in yourself in that moment, is there someone else mm. who you can imagine being right there for you in that moment? Someone maybe you know, maybe you know them very well, or maybe someone you you, you don't know, but you know of. 
Yeah. And there's something about them that you find quite inspirational. What would it be like to imagine that they're with you right now, telling you what you need to hear in that moment? Mm -hmm. Yes, and really embodying that. I mean, that was the part for me that, okay, I could imagine that, but I would go that far. And mm -hmm. instead of really imagining how it felt and sitting with it and mm -hmm. and embracing it mm -hmm. and then applying it towards the, the whatever mm -hmm. challenge that I'm up against in the moment mm -hmm. then helped co color that experience differently if I really allowed myself to to immerse myself in those in that bodily feeling yes yeah and it yeah. just and then the next time it would come up, it was, it, it was that conflict was short lived or it would come up and then I'd say, oh no, this is how we deal with it. And, mm -hmm. and it would fade. And then over time, yeah. certain things and, oh, if I had had these tools initially when I had first been sick, I think I would have recovered quite a bit sooner, but who knows, here I am. And yeah, um, recovered and now applying it to every aspect of my life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a thought and it just disappeared. But but I have another one that actually comes out of um, some experience I had recently, you know, we, we know about the power of the placebo, don't we? Mm hmm um that you know it messes up all kinds of <laughs> trials and and studies and so on but there's an expectation that about 30 35 percent of people are going to respond to something even if there's there are no active ingredients in that something simply because they believe that when they take it this or that is going to happen Yes. And there are extraordinary stories about that. You know, people thinking they're getting chemo, they're just getting saline solu solution, and many of them just losing all their body hair, all of it, um, <laughs> because they think that's what happens when you take chemo, right? Yes. Um, so one of the things I think is helpful too is to think about everything as being kind of a placebo. And what re reminded me of this was when I was sick recently on a trip to Africa, and I had this big fluey thingy, who knows what it was. And I didn't have very long before I had to come back home. Very long journey of 35 hours. Mm -hmm. So I had to do a quick rebound on this. And this lovely African man who was helping us um, in, in our palatial tent <laughs> on the safari that we were on, um, gave me all this. He, he, he looked at me, could see I was sick, came back and had all this, this bottled water and this ginger tea, and, and he put it all out beside me, and he said, you drink this, it will make you strong. And I could just feel this feeling of, oh. <laughs> so I borrowed that belief he had, mm -hmm. that every sip of ginger tea was going to make me strong. And within a day and a half, I was up and about, and then the next day we, we had to come home, and I was fine still coughing quite a bit but so I believe that that is hugely influential for all of us you know that that belief is so very powerful and remembering that when people are responding to the placebo response or having that placebo response they're not trying they're not doing anything other right. than simply thinking oh yeah this is a real something and so right right they're just yeah. believing it they just believe that this is happening it's amazing yeah. And, and the yeah. more people can understand the placebo effect and hear these numerous crazy accounts. Yeah, yeah. I think they would have a better understanding of right. what they're thinking, what they're exposed to, that our brains, our minds are listening constantly. Yeah. That we have to be um, mindful of what, we uh, expose ourselves to from the outside world and from our inside world. <laughs> absolutely. Well, which is where that's where we have, have the influence. Yes, absolutely. Um, you are so right. And then the, the, another thing I would say that I think is really, really important. And we talk about this during the training, as you well know, is what we call it the healing spiral that once we see a bit of improvement and then we start to be able to do a bit more, that that allows us to do more of the things that we love, mm -hmm. the things that bring us joy and fulfillment and satisfaction and connection and all the things that actually humans need mm -hmm. in order to flourish. 
and how that then becomes part of our healing recipe. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the opposite is true when we're thinking about chronic illness, Mm -hmm. that we become more and more separated from those things that we love and that actually feed and nourish us. We become more isolated. We're not out in the world doing interesting things. We're just totally focused in this rather small world of what our body's doing. Um, And you can see that how that takes one more and more into the course of illness Mm -hmm. rather than into the course of healing. Um, And so just thinking about every step taking us further into that beautiful healing spiral and and then focusing on on how much more and this is a key point you, you mentioned editing before and how easily we can be kind of hypnotized into believing that the way to to think about how we're doing is always to look at where we want to be when life is perfect mm-hmm. and either we reach that or we don't mm-hmm. and if we're quite good at being a perfectionist we never will <laughs> let's just accept that right Whereas it's so much more helpful to be thinking about how far have I come Mm -hmm. and keeping our focus entirely there because Mm -hmm. then that sets up an absolute belief that whatever is still left to do is easily accomplished. Yes. Oh, yes. And I love that. And that helped me so much to then take those initial steps to then have the evidence that I could influence that. And then it had this compounding effect. Like you said, then I started doing more and I see other people doing more and trying different things. And before you know it, you're feeling pretty invincible. But most importantly, like you said, stopping and recognizing, hey, I have arrived right here and enjoying this moment and seeing how far I have come instead of looking at how, where you still want to end up, which is, you know, good to have those goals, but to not obsess about those and, and enjoy the, the, the arriving and, and how far I've I've come and other people have come. Yes. And as you'll remember, again, one of the golden rules that at least I think of is of, of the lightning process is, aside from being always compassionate with oneself, is to be in the right state to do whatever it is we want to do. And that means no pushing needed. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And that many people have habitually pushed themselves a lot and thought it was essential. Um, and we can be very kind about that, that it felt useful and maybe was, but mm-hmm. it isn't any longer. Um, and that pushing and striving is partly what's amplifying the whole nervous system response and keeping it in that state of emergency. Yeah. And I think I was guilty of that or not guilty, but I think there's that element of in an unknown and a novel virus of really wanting to figure things out. Yeah. And- yeah really trying and feeling like, oh, if I tried harder, I could do this. But that Mm -hmm. then becoming so mindful and calm and then noticing that pushing or that trying just turned on that nervous system enough to where it kicked me out of receiving and moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be a very subtle place for people to work, you know, in terms of of raising their awareness of how have they been been approaching their life. And again, if there's this internal critic and this what I sometimes describe as an internal tyrant, (laughs) um, then it it might take a bit longer to Mm -hmm. recognize the signs of when we are pushing ourselves Mm -hmm. and um, learning another way, because when we're confident, that we can do something we don't need to do any pushing Mm -hmm. and when you think about elite athletes all of whom use these mind-body techniques Mm -hmm. or similar kinds of techniques um they're not pushing Mm -hmm. they are so in the groove so in the zone that would be their word of Mm -hmm. i can do this Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they're just allowing then this amazing physiology that they have to do what it knows to do Mm -hmm. which is to run fast or ski fast or whatever it may be yeah 
Yeah, I love that word allowing. And I think that's it's a word that really takes um some time to cultivate that 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 and embody that feeling of just allowing things to happen and trust and believing. And those are definitely the first steps, um, I think, in recovery. And then in believing a process like like that you teach that it's it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. And so exciting. And it is life changing, as you say. You know, so many clients that we work with initially are understandably completely focused on whatever it is that they're not recovering from and the way they, they'd hoped they would and expected to. Um, and then once that's in the rear view mirror and they they you know they've reclaimed their health, their energy, and so on, then they can use these tools to apply to any part of their life as you are doing. Yeah. And um, it's so much fun to realize that every part of life can feel more spacious, more expansive, more calm, more joyful, more whatever it is we want it to be. Um, and that we can learn these new ways of being um, to, to make the quality of our life so much better. Yes, it's endless possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see what other questions I had for you. So many, I could talk to you for hours. Um, well, that's the problem. I could talk about this for hours and I have to do this when I'm at dinner parties and so on, because I, I just feel this, oh, let me share. And I realize, oh, I'm going on and on. I better just. Well, and that, that brings, that does bring up a question. I don't even have that written down, but yeah, of course I want to share this with everybody too, but it. I found it be it important to share with people that are uh, open to yeah. this way of thinking because it really does take um, a little bit to wrap your mind around how much yeah. influence we have. You know, I'll I'll see it in other people, not even people that are struggling with um, chronic illness, but certain mm -hmm. elements of their life that you say, I hear them saying, oh, I'm so stressed out and I've had a bad day and I've got this pain and da, da, and I think, oh no, you're just mm -hmm. exacerbating this. Mm -hmm. But especially when people are going through a chronic illness, it's important to gently expose them to this concept. So they don't think you're saying, this is all in your head. Yes, your brain is in your head and your nervous system runs through your entire body and we have influence over that, but that those physical sensations are real. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? I, yeah, that is such a good point, Amy. And I, I think that, um, you know, when Phil Parker first created the lightning process nearly 25 years ago, the whole idea of the mind-body connection was just kind of woo-woo and out there. Mm -hmm. it is now very much more mainstream mm -hmm. um it's it, you know in any field it, there's there's much more understanding and sort of openness mm -hmm. to, to the, this idea that both are completely connected and one influences the other and it flows in both directions yeah and that it has been too easy for people to conclude that programs like the lightning process are sort of dismissing the the physical experience people are having the awful experience that people are having and I know this firsthand from companioning my daughter who was ill for well she missed most most of high school with chronic fatigue syndrome so I know how it feels when people don't understand mm -hmm. and there has been a feeling um, amongst many that um, this kind of approach is suggesting that people are kind of making it up mm -hmm. and that that all in your head suggestion confirms that. Mm -hmm. So we are not for a second saying that it's all in people's heads. We are saying a version of what you just said, which is yes, the brain is in the head <laughs> and the brain is connected to the nervous system and influencing the nervous system that then influences the body. Mm -hmm. So we can be influential by using our mind to change what our brain and our nervous system are doing. And that in turn changes what our physical self is doing. But it's not at all that it's we made it up or it's, you know, it, it can be dismissed that way. Um, we certainly understand that the body is really doing these things. Mm -hmm. Just what what how what is the role of the brain in this mm -hmm. and the nervous system and how can we harness that and influence that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Great. Um, 
So um, let's see one other question. Well, many other questions, but <laughs> one or two. Um, how can people become aware of that language? Is there, is, are there any little tricks of how people can be aware of that language that they're using that is so influential throughout their day, just paying attention, writing it down? Um, what would you suggest? Or would it be an exercise in writing out statements of how they want to feel only using positive wording? Yeah, so actually I'm going to um, take this in two little chunks because you've reminded me of something else I think might be helpful to talk, talk about. But on this sort of catching our unhelpful sort of stuck language, to, you know, re re referencing what we don't want, mm -hmm. um, I think mostly it's about listening and, and hearing our language in a way that we don't normally. Mm. Yeah, because we're not actually most mostly listening to what we're saying, are we? We're just you know, shoving it out there <laughs> so that someone else will do the listening. And it's quite interesting when we start listening in on our own language and the tone of our own language. Um, I'll give you an example, which I often will use in a, in a um, training. When I'm with my husband, I am not Ms. LP. You know, I'm, I'm just his wife. I'm just me. I'm just, you know, unedited, shall we say. And so sometimes I will catch myself saying something like, you know, I'm just feeling so annoyed about, doesn't matter, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I change that to language that suggests that, that I know that I'm, I'm involved in that, mm -hmm. it was what we call the active language, which we teach in the LP. So I think it's a bit much to try and explain it here because it's quite a complicated concept, but it's very helpful for me tuning into, oh, right, I have a role in this. And so maybe I can, I can, think about how I'd like to feel mm -hmm. and so you know I'm, I might catch myself in that moment and say hold on a minute I really want to feel more neutral about this mm -hmm. or more accepting or more relaxed or more something else and then I know that I'm starting to lead my brain where mm -hmm. I really want to go mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 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 and I and then the other thing that I think is helpful to say, one of the things that we ask people to do, as you'll remember, before people come to the lightning process is to describe the future that they really want because they've been understandably, again, putting so much attention on what they don't actually want. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do need to lead the brain. We do need to you know, give, give it a, a new course as it were. Mm -hmm. And so I like to think about these, um, we ask people to write about six things. I like to think of them as being like six movies that they're, they're describing as they're happening, using this, this language that fires up the brain in new and, and much more um, optimistic and powerful ways. Mm -hmm. um, and that this in and of itself would be really helpful for anybody listening mm -hmm. to think about, all right, what, what do I actually want? What is the future I want to live into? And then to spend some time finding those words that probably hey, haven't been using much, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but are in there. <laughs> and to just see um, so many people will say after they have completed this task, how much better they feel. Yes. Yes. You know, I have something on my website that I put on early on, even before I did lightning process, um, which was to to tell your recovery story. And because mm. I had a girlfriend suggest that to me early on when I was really sick and I spent a day doing that. It was a day in the midst of crap, days of crap. Mm. This day, I felt amazing. I was there. I had just shown myself that I could feel that way. Mm. And it was remarkable. Um, and fortunately, I got through COVID, but then learning from you how I can do that throughout my day in these incremental ways, mm -hmm. um, then you just live into that, into that story, into that, maybe not story, but that those sensations and, and those neural pathways just become just light up, which exactly. And that's, that, that is the process. 
Yeah. Um, that's what the lightning process teaches people how to do. And and you know, what we haven't mentioned is is the the the, the concept behind it, which is neuroplasticity. Um, and the fact that the brain changes according to how it's being used. Mm. And that when we get stuck in our health and our life, we start to use use the lightning process in, in you know, not, not lightning process. We use our brain, excuse me, in ways that are um, unfortunately strengthening all those pathways that are associated with illness and with, you know, being, being and feeling so stuck. Once we start to imagine and envision a different kind of future and use the language that really fires up those pathways, we are literally changing our brain. Yeah. And the more we do it, the more the brain adapts. And so, um, you know, we have, we have a new automatic kind of response. Yeah. And it's so cool when it happens, you almost mm -hmm. feel like, wait, did I, I forgot to do something, but it is just quieted and almost atrophied these responses that had become so habitual that now right. there's this new way that just becomes the new way of feeling and being yeah. that, um, that then again, gives more evidence that you can just continue on with that in so many areas of, of your life. Yeah. Yeah. So Amanda, I've taken up so much of your time. I'm so grateful to have you here. Um, but one other little area. So mm. you helped me so much in really embodying that feeling, the mm. sensations in my body, the states of mind, the emotions that I wanted to mm. feel. So mm. I could really identify what they were and using so many different um you know, like recruiting all these different parts of myself to then mm -hmm. support this way of being mm -hmm. that I love so much. And one of those things that you taught me was humor, that humor yeah. was really, I mean, if we've lost our sense of humor, hey, there's a little, you know, somebody thinks, saying, hey, hey, if you lost your sense of humor, <laughs> and I'm going to pay attention. Yes, yes. And that is so true. And for some people, it, it's so obviously true. It is definitely true for me because I usually find something to chuckle about. Um, and often I'm the butt of my own jokes, but that's fine because at least I'm laughing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it is absolutely true. And the converse is true that humor can be very helpful in getting us out of that stuck spot. Mm -hmm. So once we recognize, oh, my gosh, I'm really in this place. There's not, a, you know, a shred of humor to be found. Oops. Um, clearly I need to make a, make a shift. Yeah. Um, and even just taking ourselves back to a time when, when something so funny that we couldn't even control ourselves was happening, that it can start to stir up that same yeah. feeling, which then stirs up those pathways yeah. that allow us to change our state yeah. and therefore how we're using our brain. Yeah. I remember when, you know, when I was in the midst of being sick and one day, just an especially hard day, sat on the couch and I was looking at Instagram and I hadn't come across these funny video. I mean, I'd seen a funny video, but I didn't realize how if I found one that I could just keep scrolling through these funny animal videos. Yeah. And I was watching and watching and started kind of chuckling and laughing. And Corey, my husband said, it was the first time he had heard me laugh in yeah. a couple months. Yeah. And just enough just getting that generating was was so important um mm -hmm. and critical and and that leads me to <laughs> <laughs> um as we know humor is so important it's important to be able to embody that feeling and we know how good it feels to laugh so mm. end this wonderful so informative interview with you I'm going to ask you and those watching to laugh with me for 25 seconds, just 25, 25, maybe 30 seconds. We'll see how, how it goes. Um, are you, are you in? How could I not be? After that, <laughs> that <setup? laughs> okay. All right. Let me get my timer going here. <laughs> Stop watch. Okay. Alrighty. So, um, 
kind of get warmed up to get your laugh and muscles going. Imagine something like you said earlier, how good it feels to laugh or something really funny that happened in your life or a funny image maybe. And as Corey would do, cause he's done this before with, with his clients, he'll, he'll, cause he does, he's a personal trainer. He'll say, okay, let's warm up our smiling muscles. So smile, relax, smile, relax. <laughs> <laughs> that always cracks me up right there. So, okay, I will say go and we will we will laugh for 25 seconds. I find it again. Okay, ready, set, <laughs> laugh. <laughs> smile, relax, smile, relax. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Oh. oh that was good thank you for being willing to do that because i know it's yeah. a little funny a little weird but <laughs> it was very funny it took me back to this absolutely crack up time experience i had that was right yeah. back there yeah, lovely. Oh, good. Oh, good. I'm so glad. <laughs> okay. Well, Amanda, again, thank you so much and for everything and for being here and sharing your just amazing wisdom with, with everyone. And um, I'll have Amanda's information um, in the notes in case anybody wants to reach out to her. And um, hopefully we could have you on the show again sometime. Anytime. It is absolutely my pleasure. And I think, you know, it is my pleasure to help people, you know, learn these tools and take them into their life. It is just a thrill to watch people really blossom. Yeah, well, You're so good at it. And I can feel your, your generosity and your, and your love so much. So thank you so much, Amanda. Well, thank you, Amy. Have a great rest of your day. Laugh on. Yes, thank you. I will. <laughs> Okay.